Okay, this lecture covers two applications of Faraday's law. Those applications are generators, which produce alternating current, and transformers, which allow you to change voltages. Make sure, first of all, that you take a look at the demonstration video on generators at this point. Go ahead and pause this lecture now. Okay, now that you've watched that demonstration, what we're interested in finding or calculating out is the induced EMF and then ultimately the current itself. So basically what you do is you take a coil of wire and you rotate it in the presence of a magnetic field. The energy source for that rotation in a coal-fired power plant, for example, comes from the chemical potential energy of the burning coal. <coughs> the burning coal then heats up water, which turns to steam. That steam then pushes what is referred to as a turbine. Essentially, that is the rotating coil of wire in the presence of a permanent magnet. Okay, the following derivation is actually easy to describe. Here's the situation. Okay, so first of all, we have a coil of wire here like so. I'm just gonna draw it as a basic rectangle. Let's say that there are N turns associated with it, and the coil itself here has an area A. Okay, then I'm gonna have a uniform magnetic field. I'm gonna go ahead and point it out on the board at us like so. So here is the uniform magnetic field B. However, if you look at this in profile, what we'll do is we'll then take this rectangle and tip it on a side to form an angle. So in profile, it looks like this. I'll just draw one magnetic field line here, B like so. And then in profile right here, for example, we then have our coil of area A. Now the area vector itself, by definition, is perpendicular here to the coil. Ultimately, the direction associated with it comes from right-hand rule from the induced current as we rotate this in the presence here of the magnetic field. But right here is the area vector A, like so. Okay, right here is an angle, and we're then gonna change that angle with respect to time. Once again, there is some sort of energy source that is present here that is rotating the coil of wire. We're gonna rotate this such that the angle theta changes in accordance to the following. It's the angular frequency multiplied by time t. Angular frequency is two pi multiplied by the frequency itself. As a standard throughout the entire world, the frequency here is 60 hertz. Okay, so we're gonna have a changing magnetic flux here through the coil of wire as we rotate it in the presence of the permanent magnetic field. Here's then how we calculate then the induced EMF by using Faraday's law. All right, so first of all, writing out Faraday's law for this situation, it's gonna be the following. Like so. Notice the addition here of capital N because as I said, we have N turns here associated with the coil of wire. Okay, first of all, the flux itself. Okay, the flux itself is the following integral, B dot dA. However, the integration itself is quite easy in this situation. You actually end up with nothing more than B times A times cosine theta. Like so. However, of course, this is a function of time because the angle theta here changes with respect to time, it's omega t. So let's go ahead and write that into here. So, okay, now we just go ahead and just follow the math. So then therefore epsilon, the induced EMF, is gonna be the following, negative N, and then we take the derivative of this expression. All right, so B and A are constants, so then therefore we're just differentiating the cosine here with respect to time. Derivative of cosine is negative sine, that negative sine will cancel this, and then using chain rule, we're also gonna have an omega that comes out in front. So then therefore you end up with the following. Like so, as the induced EMF. Okay, now this quantity right here in front of the sign, this string of terms, this quantity right here is the peak voltage. This is referred to as epsilon naught. Recur, or, or rather um, recall that the induced, uh, excuse me, recall that the uh, RMS voltage, I meant to say, recall that the RMS voltage is this quantity here divided by root two. So this is the root mean square voltage. Like so, when I went through basically the kinematics of alternating currents back in chapter 26. 
Okay, you essentially have to know this derivation that is just specific to this situation and nothing more. Specifically, what you usually have to remember about it is the value of the peak voltage, which is this quantity right here. Here's the easiest way to remember this quantity associated with the peak voltage. Basketball omega. NBA times omega, that's how I always remember, is this basketball omega. Or if you want to think of it as women's basketball, that's perfectly fine. It's just an easy way to remember this term here for the peak voltage. Now, should you encounter this on the AP exam, it may be the derivation itself, which as you can see is quite easy once you've taken yourself through it. However, other than that, any sort of problem that you encounter would be nothing more than a plug and chuck. Now, before I get to that plug and chug problem, which is the first of the lecture examples, let's plot out the following. All right, so the induced EMF here as a function of time is just this sine curve, like so. So here's one full period. And then this right here, of course, is the peak voltage in one direction. This right here is the peak voltage in the other direction. If you take this quantity and then divide it by the resistance of the coil from Ohm's law, then you get the current as a function of time. So the current as a function of time is the induced EMF as a function of time divided by the resistance. So then therefore, if you take this quantity right here, which is the peak voltage, and divide that by the resistance, you then end up with the peak current. Recall that the RMS value of the current for alternating currents is equal to the peak divided by root two. So recall the basic kinematics then of alternating current from chapter 26, and this is essentially the cause of all of this. It's a little bit difficult to picture, however, exactly what's happening to the current within the coil of wire as we rotate it in the presence of the magnetic field. So I invite you at this point, before we take a look at the first problem, to pause this lecture and then go ahead right now and take a look at the screencast video that I've put up for you where I use a generator applet to show you exactly what's happening when you rotate the coil of wire in the presence of the permanent magnetic field. I've also, post, also have posted for you in the folder the link to the applet that I used in that screencast. So go ahead and take a look at that screencast now. Okay, now that you've taken a look at that screencast, then go ahead and copy down the first example from today's lecture examples. It's really nothing more than a plug and chug situation. I have it on my screen. Let me go ahead and do some erasing here, however. Okay, so we have the following. An electric generator rotated with a frequency f of 60 hertz. Remember, that's our standard. Like so, it's rotated in the presence of a perm permanent uniform magnetic field with a magnitude of 0.15 tesla. The coil's area is 2 times 10 to the minus 2 meters squared. Okay, part A of the problem, how many loops? So it's looking for the number of turns, capital N. How many loops are necessary to generate a peak voltage of 170 volts? If you take 170 volts and divide it by root two to get the RMS value, that turns out to be 120 volts, which is a standard, once again, in the United States. All right, so basically what we're looking for here is epsilon naught. So epsilon naught is basketball times omega. Recall, of course, that omega is two pi times the frequency. So this right here is given to us as 70 volts, or 170 volts, rather. That's the peak value. And then we're just solving for n, nothing more than that. So n is equal to epsilon naught divided by B A times 2 pi times the frequency, like so. Let me just go ahead and calculate this out. All right, so 170 and then divided by the denominator, 0.15 times 2 times 2, 10 to the minus 2, and then times 2 times pi times 60. This ultimately comes out to be it's a little bit more than 150. I'll just go ahead and round it off to 151 loops. Okay, that's part A. Okay, and then part B is to just quick, quickly calculate the RMS value. So on the problem, I write it as VRMS. That's perfectly fine. This is epsilon naught divided by root two. And as I said a few minutes ago, when you calculate this out, this is the standard here of 120 volts, okay? 
All right, so that's a brief look at generators. I'm going to go ahead and pause this as a part one, and then I'll go ahead and do part two as transformers in just a few minutes.